So, Greg, uh, I mean, not, I'm not sure if I need to tell you this, but you know, some of your shirts are kind of, kind of crappy. I mean, you know. What do you What do you mean by crappy? They got like a sweet little pocket right here. I uh, mean, that's... they could be better. I mean, there's some. There's a place I know where it has lots of lots of cool stuff. Uh, yeah, but but how cool? We're talking about triple A cool. We're talking about shirts from 86.com. They're a pretty cool site. They sell all types of merchandise, including T-shirts, keychains, and other cool stuff that they sell on their site. Uh, and they also have awesome video game material as well, such as Street Fighter, Killer Instinct, Guilty Gear, Skullgirls, Blaze Blue, Smite, and 86 own brand of T-shirts as well as, well as other stuff. Um, recently, they put out some new keychains for Street Fighter Five. So yeah, there's some awesome stuff there. So I'm just suggesting, you know. Next time you go out and buy a shirt of any kind, I suggest check out 86.com. And if you want to support us and them at the same time, please use this link in, the, in your web browser to check out 86.com. Put in www.86.com question mark AFF equals 4. Again, www.86.com question mark AFF equals 4. This link will tell them that we sent you and that we're cool with them as long as you're cool with us. Thank you and enjoy the show. Welcome to Mission Star Podcast, episode 153. We made 153 episodes of this show. I just realized that. <laughs> Jeez, man. I know. Uh, when, when did I come on? Like, episode, what, 10? Uh, I don't remember. I don't recall. It's been so long. I want to say yeah. it, maybe it was episode 10. Maybe, maybe later on in that or earlier. The funny thing about the show is, like, it was on and off for quite a while because, like, it was originally me and, like, two of my friends. And it was like every month, once a month. Like yeah, I remember. I remember you had me on as a guest quite often when I was with the other group, and it was like every couple of months you'd have me on. And when I became a, like a full time person for a oh, full time ish <laughs> for Mission Start, um, like I became a regular on the podcast, and then it just became you and me. And we've been doing this for like God two and a half years now. That, that's kind of crazy to think about. <laughs> We've been doing this podcast like to get the the two of us for for a majority of it. It's kind of crazy thing about. Yeah. It. <laughs> I gotta go back and see when our anniversary <sighs> is. I not, actually have not have uh, really looked into that. But, anyways, enough, enough talking about the past and me being old. Um, welcome to our <laughs> podcast. <laughs> we talk about games on this show. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, we talk about the biggest news in the, in the game industry in the past week. Uh, we've also been added in a new thing, uh, kind of classic uh, message sort of podcast, in a sense that we have now have a topic we discuss uh, in the second half of the show. Uh, but the first half is all news and you know, other other stuff. And uh, let's get right into it. So, speaking of the past... I, I swear, before you continue, I swear I thought you were going to pull a Keemstar and be like, let's get right into the... I was like, no! You <laughs> stop it! Uh, no, I'm not I'm not that quick, uh, quick-witted to do that. Um, but, uh... Speaking Thank God, of, on that note. <laughs> speaking of the past, as we're talking about the past, um, so, uh, Battle.net is no longer Battle.net. Now is officially Blizzard. Uh, Blizzard did, uh, announce, I was say like a week or two ago, that they, um, they, that they're changing, uh, their... Their app as or their, their app like their new, their new multiplayer platform basically to just battle dot uh, I mean to Blizzard sorry instead of battle on dot net, um which is the end of that name but for a lot of us who played um who played the game or you know previous games like StarCraft one uh, or World of Warcraft three like we always went on battle dot net to go or log in and play um StarCraft uh, and yeah it's I mean it's Kind of, it, 
it's not really much of a big deal, but in, in a sense, it, it is for some people for the, for the sake of like you know just the name recognition like no longer going to be there. Now it's going to be changed to another name. It's still the same thing, but just like now it's a different name. But it just kind of it definitely it that name does hold some resemblance to people who have played multiplayer games on Star uh, on the Blizzard's servers for StarCraft and other old, older games for quite a while, and some do actually to this day. Um, so it's kind of crazy to see the fact that that changing the tide to a new Blizzard, per se. Um, so yeah, it's it's ha- it, that's happening, and I believe that is happening now actually. So yeah, I believe it's changed like very like this week. Um, I don't know if it's today or like a couple days ago or whatever, but it's actually a really smart idea because uh, uh, from what I understand, and again, it could be wrong. Uh, Blizzard gained a ton of new people through Overwatch. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that as because that game, like every other Blizzard game, like like World of Warcraft can definitely be inclusive, but Overwatch is very inclusive. Um, it's easy accessible. It's uh, when I say accessible, I mean like it's easy to play, easy to understand, difficult to master. It's it's but the other the other Blizzard games aren't. Mm-hmm. So it made sense to a point that that people using it would, t- you know, go, go blizzard. Like what, like, how do I communicate to people? Do I go to a blizzard website? So like, it just cuts out the rigmarole. So it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And that brand apparently has been around for nearly 20 years, the battle that nap ran. So that's, that's, that's it's crazy. crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. It's definitely crazy, but it'll definitely work out. I think for them in the end, when... I think it will, I think it's a smart move. Um, yeah, it, it, it does, you know, like just kind of thinking about it way back then, as far as like how it was back in the old dial-up days, where I tried to play StarCraft on, my, on dial-up on AOL.com Jesus. and playing on my dad's laptop. <laughs> yeah, I remember my, my one of my first Blizzard experiences was uh, Diablo 2 at a buddy's Ooh, house. Yeah. Oh god, so much fun with that. Yeah. Did you go online with Diablo 2 or did you? No, we just we beat the campaign and then. Uh, um... Well, I say we, he beat the campaign and I watched him do it. Um, but uh, um, he had, like, read in, like, Game Pro or some of that effect that uh, you could um, you could create a portal to go to a cow level. Oh, yeah, the infinite and cow level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For Seriously, for, like, two straight weeks, that's all we did. We tried to beat the cow <laughs> level. Learning very shortly, you can't. So, yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. It's, it will be missed, but like all things, things must change. So, going on to our next story. Um, this is a game that you specifically love a like, or a like a, a lot, I should say. Okay. Um, and this is a game that I gave it a chance and I kind of fell off of it because of certain things. But, this is from, uh, VG247, uh, written by, give me a second here so I find the editor. Ah. Sheriff Shed, or Sh- Sh- Sharif Sad. Uh, I'm going to just continue butchering names when I keep doing this podcast. <laughs> uh, title, League Destiny 2 poster reveals September release date, pre-launch beta. Uh, League Destiny 2 posters and network have popped up online, revealing a September 8 release date. The poster said to have leaked from GameStop Italy was posted on NeoGap. It mentions that its release date at the top as well as the confirmed beta will take place in June. The full sentence is cut off, but it probably refers to the beta as a pre-order bonus. Either that or pre-order, pre-ordering gets you the early access to the beta first on PS4. And I'll put the link in the chat for anyone to read the whole article. So, not surprised the fact there's going to be a Destiny 2 going to be happening. Uh, and more than likely, it was probably going to be supposed to be revealed at E3, but you know, with information and, and leaks nowadays, it's kind of hard to, to do that. But here's what, here's what I'll say. Yeah. Here's what I'll say. Even okay, so I, for those who don't know, I, I played uh, uh, Destiny for like a week, week and a half straight. Got into level twenty. I stopped playing. Uh, here about Destiny too. You know what? I I'm actually gonna give the game a chance. Like I had I had the, the times I had fun with the game. It was fun. The you know the shooting was great. You know there were definitely was some some uh, some combat uh, situations where it made it a lot of fun uh, between an AI or between me and another person. But um, I'm actually I'm actually down to play Destiny 2. I'm willing to try this out. So I am. Um, 
I have a tentative relationship with that game because, as we all know, Activision fucked up the game. Like, we all know that Activision came in, ripped it apart, and said, this is how you're releasing the game. And and a lot of people left because of it. The head writer, uh, yeah. Marty O'Donnell, a lot of people left yeah. because they thought this was a bad way to sell the game. Mm-hmm. And I completely agree. I think uh, the way the game is right now is more or less more, if you ask me, <laughs> is how it should have been released day one. Yeah. Um, the biggest problem with the game that I have right now is the game's been out for, it'll be out for two, uh, no, it's, it hit two years. Mm-hmm. It hit two years last year. Mm-hmm. And I played it for a month after it came out because a six hour campaign is not enough, but it's not just that there was a six hour campaign that sucked. There was, I, I realized my arms are on my table here. That's why I moved them down. Cause my camera's just like, goo, 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 goo. Uh, I'm in like a Star Trek earthquake. Um, uh, it's not that a six hour campaign isn't enough because a six hour campaign isn't, is totally enough. Uh, if, if, if the the problem is is that the game never told you anything. The any of the characters that you met would wouldn't tell you any story to, or storylines. You didn't learn anything. You had to dive deeper into the like uh, what the card system that I had they have. I don't remember, oh, but it was on a different site. Right. You had to, you had to actually le- uh, read the, the deeper lore on a website, mm-hmm. not in the game. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. That uh, the amazing. lore the lore of Destiny is fantastic. It just wasn't in the game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then the post game stuff was so boring. Three strikes that take a half an hour apiece, mm-hmm. that's not enough. Mm-hmm. Like, what what makes a multiplayer game last a long time? It's a replay value, like whatever it may it's be. It's replayability. Know? Okay, so like let's yeah. take a Call of Duty, a Battlefield, Overwatch, mm-hmm. uh, Battlefront, for crying out loud. Right. It has. They each have over 10 maps, right off the bat. Each uh, game can take up to 10 minutes, 20 minutes, Mm -hmm. and then you go to the next map and you do it all over again. Now, if you play for about an hour, if you play for two hours, the chances of you playing the same map over are are pretty low, just because of the rotation and how often that map will pop up. Mm -hmm. Um... So it kind of keeps the game fresh. Every day you don't know what map you're getting, and and but with with, with Destiny, it was three. That's it. Yeah, there were so many good ideas in Destiny. I feel like just was not executed uh, executed right. Like I love the fact there's like some daily event happening, and you may be out in the world doing your own mission, and it happens right in front of you, and then you go chase that objective with other people joining in. Like that was cool. The problem with the daily events though is that they would. Uh, they would pop up as like regular missions. Yeah. And you wouldn't have like, there's nothing worse than in an RPG when you have a mission and there's no, like there's no way of knowing exactly how to do it. Yeah. There's I, no direction. Yeah. I, there were some great ideas in destiny and there were some good things that worked, but there was a lot of things that they did wrong as well. From what, yeah. From what I've been reading from people who were working on destiny from just insiders in general, Destiny 2 will be what Destiny 1 should have been. So I'm actually looking forward to Destiny yeah. 2 a lot. Same here. If that's if that if they can pull off what they initially wanted to in Destiny, I would be really excited. <laughs> cuz I was I was really excited when Destiny came out cuz I was just looking at the trailers and what they're talking about. I was like, "Man, this is awesome. So many good ideas and you know, just have it fall flat." Yeah. And this is like, yeah. Uh, um, but we'll see. Very disappointing. We'll see. We'll see. Um, I may pre-order. I don't know. I'm. I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna hold on. Hold off. I should say to see what they say. But uh, I'll keep. We'll definitely keep an eye on it. All right. So going on to our next story. Um, so, Greg, you've been a huge proponent in uh, defending microtransactions. Yes. Um, so it, it, it also depends on the situation. Like I won't I won't tell you that a microtransaction is worth it. But I don't think it is. But mm-hmm. so um, I have actually caught some wind about, about this story uh, for the past week, and uh, this was reported by PCGamer.com by Stephen Messner. Uh, Four Honor players did the math on his macro transactions and uh, aren't happy about it. 
Uh, For Honor had an easy ride since launching about a month ago between persistent connection problems, bugs that were never fixed from beta, and lively arguments over what constitutes fair play. Enjoying Ubisoft's refreshing uh, take on fighting games to an uphill battle. Now there's a new reason for fans to be up in arms. For For Honor's microtransactions are... Ex- I'm going to... Which, oh, it's, it's really expensive. <laughs> Coming off the heels... Over $700. Yes. Coming off the heels of new emotes costing 7,000 steel in in-game currency. This can be bought in chunks of 5,000 to... Uh, chunks of 5,000 for 499 Players have done the math on how long it would take to grind out every unlockable and aren't happy with the results. Uh, and then it crunches numbers as far as like what exactly that would entail. And I'll just give you the brief here. Here's the gist. Each hero in For Honor takes 91 5,000 steel to unlock all the customizations included in the base game. Since there is currently 12 heroes available, that means to unlock everything in For Honor, you need 1,098,000 steel. That is approximately 7.32 of the $100 steel packs. So Ubisoft has valued their in-game unlocks within the base game at a $732 overcharge of the original $60 to $100 spent on the game. Um, And I'll post this link. It goes into some deep deep details about this, but what do you you think about this one? Like, like, it's it's these these are a perfect example of uh, pardon the French bullshit microtransactions. Um, I think that. When I defend microtransactions, I defend the idea that they do not affect the game. Um, And there are objects in this game that could have been that. However, that's not the case. There are weapons and armor that you can get in this game that make you stronger. Period. Mm -hmm. Um, And those are not unlockable unless you spend uh, just a ridiculously large amount of time or you pay over seven hundred dollars for it. Yeah. Um, that is bullshit. And then the the worst part about it is the I don't remember who defended it from the the, the company itself, but oh, I heard about this. Yeah. Yeah. The the he he defended it by saying, well, if you play League of Legends, you don't unlock everything. Yada yada yada. Or he like he was talking about other games, and he was just saying like in this game you don't unlock everything. Someone's like, why would you? build your economy your within game economy to fit those types of games and he used like free to play games as an example if a free to play game has $700 worth of unlockable items and you have to either spend $700 or you know 7 years that makes more sense because it's a free to play game mm-hmm. but this doesn't make sense this is a this is a full price game this is, this a, is a full $60, price game dollar game <laughs> It was a really, it's a, like, this is an example of bullshit microtransactions. Now, like I said, if the microtransactions were just like colors or like, yes, yes, or if the armor didn't matter, if the weapons didn't matter, they were just cool, mm-hmm. it wouldn't be a problem, but they do matter. Yeah. This like, is, if you play the game, you know they matter. Yeah. This is where microtransactions can be, this is what, what some gamers feared about for the longest time when they were first introduced, as far as like having these, uh, Im- these these price walls for content that's literally in the game and this is something that we can point to is like this is exactly how you do it wrong like this is not the way you do it you're literally cutting off ways for a player to progress in a game by putting it on a price wall i've talked about numerous times i've talked about numerous numerous times about how we pay less for games now than we ever have because Congress passed a law a long time ago saying that our digital media, well, no, video games is basically what I'm talking about, yeah. have to, they cannot go above a certain paywall. And that paywall is 60. 100%. That's like when a company goes, well, we're going to put out a $70 version, they have to say, like, because it has DLC or it has extra content. And that's how they get away with that. Otherwise, they, they can't. They cannot get above that $60 paywall. But games cost way more to make than that. And uh, there has to be a way for those companies to make money back. There has to be. Uh, Rooster Teeth on The No, their, their channel The No, put out like an yeah. 11 minute video about this. And it says exactly everything that I've been saying for like a year and a half to two years. Um, 
uh, so so as as gamers, as people who want to play games, you have two options: deal with microtransactions, or or be willing to pay a hundred dollars for a standalone game. Yeah. I, well, to, and also on top of that, like, um, I was gonna say, I think gamers now, they're they're tolerant of of microtransactions now than they were back then. Um, well. But, I mean, there's still people who still gripe and, and, and moan about it, but like, we're, for the most part, like me and like you know a bunch of others are more like, we know that microtransactions will be in some games and it's there, as long as it does not affect the content of the game. It's like it's purely cosmetic, or is, is purely just does not affect the game as, as. Well, like take take you know Mass Effect and Drown, for example. There's microtransactions, and it's totally for items that you could that could make you stronger, well, higher higher based weapons. Stronger armor, uh, higher class characters. But here's the fun factor about Mass Effect Andromeda. There is no there is no versus mode. Uh, they have a multiplayer. It's not versus. Is it not? It, it's I thought wave it was. based. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. Yeah, it's four players versus AI. So who cares at that point, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, nobody's complaining about it because of that reason. Mm-hmm. Um, at least I haven't heard much complaining because when it comes to the Mass Effect and Drone, we'll get to that later. Uh, mm-hmm. um, uh, or Overwatch for that, you know, for another example. Like everything in Overwatch is like nothing affects the core gameplay at all. Um, so like nobody complains about that too much. I've heard a little bit, but not too much. Um, and uh, it's also like a great way to keep a game that. Like developers want the game to last longer on the market. That's a great way to to support that. Right, right. Um, I'm trying to think of another example that's not those two that works in that category. So I'll give an example. So okay, I believe it was Dead Space three. I want to say might have been. No, it was three. It was three. Um, they there were some in-game items that you can usually earn um, by just discovering them in the game. Um, but they gave you an option to like microtransactions to buy, you know, said item to boost up your, um, to boost up your, uh, your, uh, your character, you know, get the, your character a bit more stronger now than later on. Um, you know, th- th- those things that I think are fine because like you, there are still ways to earn those in game and not, uh, preventing you not to do so, like we like like here, like you can still earn this armor, but it's gonna take you a crap ton of hours, and crap, and uh, you know, absurd amount of time to get it. Right, and that's and that's more so like I think I think the linchpin right there is like the stuff in over in, in For Honor affects the game. Yeah, like, that's that's the big thing because it's it's, it's, a, it's a versus game. Like this, is, that's a it's a huge thing in this. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I, I can't defend For Honor. Uh, there's no defending For Honor in this category. Um, if it, like I said, if it was just, if it was just cosmetic, if it made like armor glowy or what the hell ever, I don't care. Um, it wouldn't be a big issue, but, but it, it's, a, it's a big issue and, um, it's not going to work. Like I get, I get it. Ubisoft, I get it. It, 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 it costs a lot of money to make make games i mean if we can get into that conversation later about mass effect i can also kind of go into that because it it rolls into that um but um you have to you have to do it right you have to do it to an extent that doesn't make the gamer feel like well if i don't have money or time i can't play this game exactly. you cannot do that exactly exactly speaking of mass effect You've been playing the game for the past week, I would say. I put about I just put just under 17 hours into it. So okay, so we want to check in with you regarding your play with Mass Effect. Like, what do you think of the game so far? Like, what what do you think so far? So, a lot of people have been critiquing the beginning of it as starting slow, um, and I think that those people either a don't remember what it's like to play a Mass Effect game, or just weren't expecting. Um, like 75% dialogue, 25% action, or even less on that action percentage. Um, 
because when I started playing the game, I played it for five hours when I put it in, mm-hmm. and I play and I, I and I shot things for about a solid hour mm-hmm. of that five. So, um, uh, the um, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Uh, um, and the game, like the storyline's really good. I really enjoy what they're doing with the plot. Uh, I think it's very fun. Um, but there have been, there have been a few hic- like, like graphical hiccups here and there. Like sometimes when I'm driving the, the, uh, the nomad across like, uh, an, a huge area, mm-hmm. um, it'll like the whole game will like load in a next, like the next, the next place that I'm about to go to. Mm-hmm. And so the whole game like hiccups real hard. Other than that, it's not too much. I did have, like, a weird... Like, I was talking to two characters, and uh, one of the characters, like, model got stuck in T-pose. <laughs> well, but here's the weird part. Like, his character got stuck in T-pose, but a, a copy of him was still in cutscene. So it was like he was standing inside his own T-pose character. Um, and that's a, gra- that's, that's a graphical glitch that I've seen happen to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's actually a reason why the game has, like pseudo bad animation and graphical glitches like that um which i can get into if you want me to um let's see well you can you can for a little bit yeah okay briefly i'll try to make as brief as i can so one of uh, an ex uh bioware animator uh came forth and talked about this um he's also worked on uh, uh uh with naughty dog on the fourth uncharted game and he explains that the way, the way that a game like Mass Effect has to work, the, like any and, and Bethesda too, for that matter, you have to make base animations that run in correlation with the other development team. So a game like Uncharted, or you know, any other linear-based game, you're able to take time with the cutscenes. You're able to take your, you know, like like extended periods of time because they aren't based on decisions they aren't based on numerous trees that the, that the character can talk when a game like mass effect or or um a bioware game and uh, a bethesda game you have just tons and tons of dialogue you can't make everything fit into this nice house without sacrificing something now, given Bioware another $40 million and another year, it might have looked better. But that's not the case here. EA wanted the game out now, and the game came out now. And um, is it totally distracting? No, uh, it's not. It's um, if, if, if you're that distracted by, by puppets talking, then I don't know what else to tell you. Um... There are, like, it's it's not, it's noticeable. I notice it, and I'm a fan. I'm a defender of Mass Effect. Um, but it's nothing, it's nothing that bad. It's nothing to the extent of, like, well, I'm going to knock this game down, like, 80 points because of bad animation on on human faces. What I will say, yeah, what I will, say, what I will say about <laughs> it is that, the thing for because like Mass Effect has a, has always been having uh, at least when it comes to well, the original series like it was a great story and like most I mean depending on how you play but like for me like I often talk to my crewmates I often talk to a lot of people because the conversations are always fun to always always fun to um to have this conversation and talk and just learn about the story and the character when that's kind of your your main thing in Mass Effect and like you see those animations kind of be weird or the way they're animate just not correctly it kind of takes you out a little bit sure sure but I think I think also on that note like I mean th- this is a whole another conversation too um yeah but what exactly is immersion because I've never been in a situation in my life where I'm holding a controller and I get so lost in the game that I lose time like it for me to get to that point, um, it has to be something that I'm really, really into, and I've never been into something that much to where that's a problem. 
Uh, like today, for example, I played it for two hours. I meant to play it for an hour. The reason I went an extra hour is because I really wanted to finish up a mission. I didn't want to come back to it. Mm. And that took me an extra hour to finish. Um, uh, but uh, I just think that like the story is so much fun. The idea of the stories, the theming in the story, too, is a lot of fun. Something that Mass Effect 1 never hit on, or the, the original trilogy never hit on. Uh, but, like, even when it comes to story, I'm seeing a lot of criticism that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, for example, uh, something that drives me nuts about people playing Mass Effect as a whole, or just stories in general. Um, Ross from Game Grumps, he tweeted out this problem that he had about in the original Mass Effect games, you would use mass relays to get from, to get across the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, yeah. In this game, you're in the Andromeda galaxy, and yet they're able to travel from system to system without any problem and with no mass relays. Mm -hmm. He had to be pointed out to him that we're not in the whole galaxy. We're in a cluster. And in a, within a cluster, we can travel from star system to star system, well, solar system to solar system, without mass relays. To travel to another cluster on the other side of the Andromeda Galaxy, we need a mass relay, but that's not what we're doing here. That's not what this game is. And uh, and when he then he he was like, oh, I guess we're in just a cluster. Um, the game made it very confusing, and I wanted to scream in his face. The game tells you this right in the beginning. Had you been paying attention and not put going on Twitter saying, "Man, the beginning of this game is slow," you would have picked that up. But instead, you didn't. That, right there, is my biggest problem with the people who play Mass Effect and are judging it unfairly. Um, my, my biggest problem with people in Mass Effect 3, just not paying attention to the dialogue given, not paying attention to the story, and then judging it on their not paying attention. So, I was going to say, like, so, aside from, all, aside from the problems it has and... and, and people will play in a game you are still having a lot, a lot of fun with the game right i'm having a blast um i i like i'll spend just like like today i spent almost two hours just on the main hub which is essentially kind of like the uh, the citadel in the, the original trilogy mm -hmm. um the combat is is neat uh it plays a little bit more like uh like uncharted where you lock into cover automatically right. and just by pressing back you get out of cover um, there are, uh, there are really, really fun story elements that, like yesterday, I hit, like, a huge, like, piece of it. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the equivalent to this in, like, Mass Effect 1 would have been the choice between saving Ashley or Caden. Oh, nice. And it was, I had to take, like, a solid, like, two to three minutes to think about what I wanted to do. Yeah. I remember, I remember that moment for me too, like when I when I played Mass Effect One, like that moment between Ashley and Caden. Like I literally, I I I think what I did, I, I put the controller down, I went outside, just like thought about it for like a good couple minutes before I made my my, made my decision. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it totally awesome. Um, yeah, it was it was it definitely like and for like other parts of the game after that, I've been having to deal with the repercussions. Yeah. But my mind my mind reels, and this is the point that I get about like. Like, uh, uh, what was the word I used? Um, oh, immersed into the game. Mm -hmm. While I'm playing it, and I'm and I'm trying to figure out where to go next and doing side missions, I'm going, I wonder what conversations would have been like had I chosen the other option. Like, I start to think about that as I'm playing it, like, thinking about the other branches, and, you know, I, I'm romancing one character. What if I started flirting with somebody else? Like, would that character notice? I'm thinking about those things. I'm not thinking about... Man, it's tough being a Pathfinder. Like, I don't do that. I don't know who does. It's such a weird concept to me to sit there and be like, well, I'm going to choose options that I would choose. Like, you're not playing a tabletop RPG where that... And even if you are, you're playing a character. You're not playing yourself. That's such a weird concept to me that people don't quite get. Like, if you're playing a character, you should be choosing what that character's doing, not what you would do, mm. Right. Well, I don't know. that's I mean, just my that's my concept. It's, it's, it's Patreon. Like I, I, uh, when I played Mass Effect one, two, and three, like I just 
played myself. Like I, I, I like the fact that I want to put myself in the game, so I actually model myself um, in the game as close as I can, um, and like I would like choose stuff like what I do in this situation, you know, and I'll just kind of go off of there. But you know, to each your own when it comes to that. But it sounds like you're still having, having fun in the game. Like I haven't bought the game yet. Yeah. I'm- um, it's a blast. It's a I blast. will definitely get it um, when I can. Uh, I, I just got paid too, so. Oh, and to keep, to, I hit a moment of little, a little bit of overwhelmingness. Um, I hit a planet side, and uh, I didn't realize I was picking up a shit ton of missions for that planet. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, it was like, hey, there are seriously like ten to fifteen missions I couldn't count that are on this map and the map size just so you know mm-hmm. is roughly the size of um a small city oh okay you're like oh okay oh cool. god <laughs> that's awesome all right so, yeah. so uh now we move on to our topic of tonight oh uh, i thought we were gonna do the other thing well i mean we have a half hour unless you want to go overtime our, our main topic might not go that long. And plus, it'll only take me a few minutes. Oh, okay. Well, then, if that's the case, then I'll let you do your, your thing then. So give me a second here as I type it out. Uh, let's okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a new segment in the show. It is called Overwatch News with Greg because he <laughs> loves him some Overwatch. And we he... never we never talk about Overwatch on the, on, the, on the podcast, and I always want to because there's always something happening within the community or with Overwatch as a whole, and I think it's really cool. So a few things right off the bat. Uh, Overwatch this week got a new character. The, the hero is now live and no longer on the PTR, Orissa. I'm sure that everyone's heard about her because there's been a lot of stuff going on over the past month. Uh, but I've got a chance to play her, and she's fantastic. Uh, she's a great, a great anchor to a team. Um, I think that she can get murdered pretty quickly if you don't have the right team comp. Um, something that my friends and I have been doing a lot is uh, the um, uh, Reinhardt, sorry, Reinhardt, Orisa, and Mercy combo, um, and that's a lot of fun. I really, really enjoy that. Uh, other news is that Jeff Kaplan was on the forums today talking about that there's a lot of skins that are coming out this year that he thinks are, everyone's going to really enjoy, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, they're supposed to be adding No Gravity as an option in the custom games on the um, custom games browser. Uh, so if that's if that's something that interests you about playing Overwatch with uh, low gravity, which it does me, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, definitely want to check that out. Uh, and there was one other thing, and I don't remember what it was exactly, but... Oh, that's what it was. King Drow got a lighting adjustment, uh, the map which takes place in London. Um, they felt like it was a little too dark, a little too doom and gloom, so they brightened it up quite a bit. Um, a lot of hallways and whatnot are just brighter and... Uh, but slight adjustment, slight, slight, slight adjustment. I think that's that's really good. I know that Lucio... Lucio's getting a reworking, and I think McCree is supposed to get a reworking here soon. Uh, Lucio's reworking definitely makes him more fun to play and less like of a must-pick on every comp team, uh, or competitive team, I should say. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to see how that works, since he was kind of the, my go-to character every time, because I play support mainly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to Tuesday when we can bring Orisa into competitive and actually see how well she does with certain players and certain team comps and uh, have a lot of fun with that. So that's been your Overwatch Minute with Greg. I should definitely just make a little, little video thing for you so every time we, we cut to you about this, it's Overwatch News with Greg. Oh, uh, every, every week it'll be a thing. <laughs> yeah, I should work on that. Yeah. Actually, I might, actually, I might, I might be able to do it, actually. Um, yeah, that sounds good. All right, well, thank you, Greg, for the Overwatch Minute for today. No problem. Now we can now we can move on to our main topic of tonight's discussion. And this 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 topic was kind of um, brought on because we had this uh, we had this discussion over Twitter, which is oops, ow, I just hit my own microphone. <laughs> um, good job. Glad glad nobody saw that. Um, so we had this conversation on. Uh, on Twitter the other day, which was, you know, kind of a bad place to have conversations sometimes. Um, 
But one of the things that uh, was tweeted out or, you know, that was potentially leaked was that there's going to be a new Call of Duty game, not a surprise, uh, by Sledgehammer Games Games uh, for 2017 or just going to be revealed at E3. And that game was a poster of uh, like a classic World War II uh, battle scene, literally in the title, Call of Duty WW2. Whether this may be the case or not, we don't know exactly. Um, but it's pointing towards possibly yes, it's happening. And Greg, you brought up the idea, the idea or the point that, you know, do we really need to go back and punch Nazis, uh, Nazis again to, uh, again for the the hundredth I... time? I think for me, there's there's the there's the fact that like I'm just tired of of World War II games. Right. We had so many of them back in like the PS2 and the early Xbox days that I just I'm tired of it. Uh, and that's a personal thing. It's it's my it's my same thing about like zombie games. I'm just tired of zombie games. Mm-hmm. But um, at the same time, I feel like going back and and playing World War II again, or or like. Even World War One, for that example, and there was a lot of jokes about that. It kind of takes away the impact that those wars had. Now, granted, it's history, and history can be kind of boring, even if it is a war. Um, there's a lot of a lot of like important themes and ideas and stuff that were that happened during World War One and World War Two, and I feel like playing a multiplayer game within that time setting takes away that impact. No, well, it does. Um, well, it does. It, it, you become a, a super soldier. You become Superman for, for that, that matter because you're a one-man army uh, most of the time. Um, what th- what I'm kind of getting at and it's kind of something we talked about on Twitter is just, you know, when an idea is overused or when when something that, you know, that we had a lot back then, like when is it really a good idea to bring it back? And There's that. There's that too. And and the thing for me is that in I said this podcast, like I'm I'm pretty excited for if if a World War Two shooter is, is back with Call of Duty because we didn't had a, a classic World War Two shooter in a long time. We had a World War One shooter with Battlefield and that proved to be very popular and very um uh, very successful and it sells and people playing it. Uh, especially the way it was told too through the stories, which I uh, I freaking awesome. I there, there, there's definitely a point where if you, in, in, in it's trend in the game industry, if you use one idea that worked with this game, it will possibly end up being used over and over again through other games. So they can cash in on that idea too for their games. And, you know, example, World War Two shooters, zombies, ton of them. Um, and I want to say another one I could try and think of, like maybe... Uh, <laughs> I want to say like there was a there was a time where like everything was sandbox. It was like a sa- sandbox game. Um, oh, I think there was actually. Yeah, not thinking about it. Kind of now. I think I think I think oversaturation is a huge aspect to being tired of something. Uh, I know a lot of people who are getting real tired of superhero movies. Um, and I totally I I I am a hundred percent behind that idea of getting tired of something. If you are the type of audience that does not care about it, because there's too much of it, then absolutely, like, you're not going to be interested in it. Yeah. Um, do I think that that's an inherent problem? It can be. Um, I think for this situation, I, I the market seemed to understand that World War II was kind of overplayed and overdone mm-hmm. and moved away from it. it. But now there seems to be a resurgence of people that are like, oh, I'd love to go back. Yeah. Um, and I think that in a weird way, weird way world war ii video games hit a nostalgia nerve which is which, weird to say think uh, it absolutely is. is yeah that's like cool. that's kind of why i'm saying it out loud right now in this weird like slow marauding context because yeah. it's like going you know i got over cancer when i was a kid <laughs> But oh, the nostalgia being in a hospital. It's 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 that weird concept, right? Like, oh man. It, I mean, it's not the exact same. The right, analogy is right. not great. I get, but... I, I, get, I get what you're saying, though. Here's the thing, though. It's like if if you if you if you played games in the game in uh, in the game industry or to kind of have a, a know how of how the game industry works, um, it goes by trends. And when Absolutely. you have when you have one trend that goes on forever and then it goes away for a while. You know, and you do another trend that is happening right now, 
that old trend that you didn't like back then, if you bring that trend back, people are going to be actually more excited about it because um, it's it's a, it's a new thing. Like right now, the trend I see is that there's a lot of um, a lot of a lot of sci-fi, a lot of a lot of space games as of late uh, in the past. Well, in the past year and a half, but it has it has been broken up other games as well, indie games and whatnot. But to me, it feels like there's a little bit of, of a bit more of the sci-fi genre. Not that I think. I think for me, like, you're, you're making a good point. Like, I think the problem isn't that the genre itself, if you want to call it a genre. Um, yeah, because you can use genre, I'm sure. I don't know, because genre is shooter. Like, World War II isn't a genre. Uh, setting? Yeah, setting. An idea? Uh, and, Ooh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think when an idea is overused is when you start to see less and less originality from that idea. Yeah, that's true. So so if we could see a World War II game that took a spin and added, I don't know, sci-fi elements, that'd be neat. I'd play that. I would, it wouldn't even feel like a World War II game at that point. Um, I feel like that happened before. but It kind of uh, has. It <laughs> absolutely has. But I'm, my point is, is it hasn't happened to the point of sat- oversaturation. Right, right. Yeah. Uh like yes, sci-fi games, absolutely, and I think that, like for me, what makes Mass Effect stand out from other sci-fi games is the fact that it is less about space exploration and more about, like that that personal interaction with characters. You know, like I, that's what really is cool about it to me. But I mean, other games have that, right? Um. Uh, and and there's nothing wrong with like multiple things of the same thing coming out yeah like zombies for example i feel i feel like zombies became an oversaturation because two things there was a bunch of games that were just adding it to their game yeah just making it a part of the game i was like that's weird yeah um but also like we were just seeing a lot of it at one time and nothing nothing super original yeah i think left for dead was like the most original zombie thing that we had seen and uh it was left. It was Left 4 Dead, and it was also um, the zombie mode in Call of Duty, which that I, I want zombie to mode in Call of Duty is what really sparked it. I yeah, think, I feel like yeah, because um, then every game was just adding it. Like I remember when Red Dead Revolver had it. Or I'm sorry, Red Dead Redemption had yeah, it. Yeah, I remember that. That's still a DLC, and actually that was actually pretty. It good. was good. Yeah. It was good, but it was still weird, man. Like it was still like kind of like why, why is this know. here? Um. But I get, I get why people were adding it to their games. Like, if something's popular enough, you kind of want to push it in. You want to add to it. Uh, I think uh, um, Left 4 Dead, or not Left 4 Dead, but Last of Us was definitely a zombie game that didn't, like, it put, it turned the zombie genre on its head. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know, man. Like, I think, for me, World War II is definitely overused to go back to the topic, to go back to the subject. I think World War II is definitely overused for me because the first four Call of Duties were World War II. Yeah. The first two Medal of Honor... No, first three Medal of Honor games were World War II. Yeah. Uh, they even went back to World War II in, in, uh, in for, for Call of Duty called uh, World at War. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I'm. I know I'm forgetting some World no, War Two there's, games. There's, there's, there's definitely a lot. Like I remember big. I remember playing Big Red One for the original Xbox. That was. Yeah. There's. Yep. Yep. That was a World War Two shooter. Um, what was that game? It was actually that was actually a good game though. It was. Uh, oh man, Brothers in Arms. Brothers in Arms was actually a great game, but like that was also another World War Two shooter. Although it was a third person World War Two shooter, so I'm gonna count that in there. Eh. It still counts as a World War II shooter. Yeah. Also, I got a little cold. Yeah, I noticed that. Um. <laughs> um it's uh, let's see. What, what did Josh say in the chat? Uh, kind of off topic, but a few years back, they did a Transformers of Joe Comics in World War II, um, and it focused on the result of the humans gaining access to Cybertronian tech and how it changed the direction of the war. And and I, I know I understand why you are adding that, Josh, to like that whole bringing a spin to the World War II genre, and I think that that's 100% where I'm thinking, where I'm going with this, with, like, how to, how to change it or, or spin it. Um, uh, so... A squad tactics game, okay. Yeah, yeah. I just, I oh, just... Yeah. 
like, my friends and I, who play video games all the time, like multiplayer games, I should say, we get really, really bored with just standard shooters. Like, to us, Halo 5 was one of the worst multiplayer games we had ever played. Is it a bad multiplayer? No. Is it a boring multiplayer? God, yes. Now, why is it a bad multiplayer? Because we've done it. We've been there. I've talked to you about, about wanting Quake again. Like oh, yeah. Quake's coming back, and oh, you're yeah. super excited for it. Oh, yeah. I'm not. And I'm not excited for it because I've played it. I've been there. Why are we rehashing? Why? It's new. It's There's there's new but stuff. But it's not there's new. new it's not new, Anthony. Yes, there is. There's new characters. The Who characters cares? have not been in Quake. <laughs> Who uh, cares if it's new characters? If the gameplay hasn't changed, then that it's not, not new. I mean, you can argue that... You can argue that a lot for a lot of other games that have not changed yet are pretty pretty popular just like, i mean i i'm not saying going wanting to go back and and relive something is a bad thing i'm not saying that because dear god i want to play the new i want to play the remake or the remaster of bulletstorm but i'm also saying that i recognize that bulletstorm is not original and that bulletstorm is just hitting my nostalgia nerve um i totally recognize that and understand that and Bulletstorm will be a rental. It won't even be a buy because I'm not – I don't want to support that mentality. To me, I put my money towards things that are decently original. Um, and I say decently because, again, yes, I did spend I did spend my money on Power Rangers this last week or this weekend. So Yeah, yeah, yeah same here. <laughs> um, and that's not – I mean they did make it original-esque. Like, they did take the assets and just kind of turn them on its head. Mm -hmm. But, also, the Power Rangers never went away. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I guess, I, guess, I guess my point about, like, the World War II games is they were overused in the past, and thanks to Modern Warfare, that shifted. The idea of what a war game should or shouldn't be definitely shifted, thanks to Modern Warfare. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to, like, Twitch reaction shooters, CSGO definitely took that away from uh, a Quake. Um, I feel personally they did. Uh, when it comes to hero shooters, uh, you know, Team Fortress is definitely on the scene, but now Overwatch is king. Yep. Um, and I think that, like, when wanting to rehash the past... When one, like that, that's another thing, Anthony. That's another question I have. What what from World War Two can they do again? Are they just? Are we, do, how many times do I have? How many times do I have to see Batman's parents die before we all get it? Um. Well, I mean, and I use that in here, terms of here, storming storming well, Normandy. Well, here's the thing: is like at this point, yes, you're right. There's nothing left you can actually tell as far as what exactly in World War Two, unless there's some other hidden war or skirmish that happened that we don't know about that you know was in history books or somebody has knowledge of um but what i will say is i think people are not going to get tired of that story as weird as it sounds i think that people are going because if one thing i don't one, one positive thing to take away from this is the fact that yeah you, yes you are well kind of but you are learning some history of what happened during that time and constantly is reminded of what happened in World War II. Um, and I think that companies will probably retell the same story over and over again or find some other war that happened or that was during the time of World War II. Um, it's going to happen. It's almost the same thing as like movies. Do we need to see a reboot of, of certain movies that are out there like Power Rangers? No. But it's going to happen anyways. Like... I don't think it's, I, don't, I don't think I'm going with a need. I think my, more more my argument is just like with Power Rangers, it felt a bit different. Uh, with Power, like if we had one or two World War II games, Anthony, mm -hmm. it would make I I I wouldn't even probably we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. But again, like <laughs> the World War II theming is absolutely overdone. And it still feels overdone to this day. It's been a while. It's been a while since we had a World War II shooter. A good one. It has. It had, sure. I'm not. Yeah. It has been a while since we've had a World War II shooter, but we had like eight of them, back to back to back to back to back. 
for a while. Yeah, we did. Um, I just can't see me wanting to shoot Nazis in the face again unless it's, like... And even then, I wouldn't want to... Like, I'm just... I'm tired of shooting Nazis in the face. Plain and simple. I'm tired of shooting them in Wolfenstein. I'm tired of shooting them in World War II games. I'm tired of shooting them in modern days. I don't want to shoot Nazis anymore. Like... I played I played Mafia Three and I don't mind shooting racists in the face, but I don't want to shoot Nazis anymore. Hmm. As a matter of fact, I love shooting racists in the face <laughs> in Mafia. <laughs> um, and you know, to each their own. And like you know, when it comes to like what their preference to games and like you know, maybe a certain genre or an idea that was out for so long that you know left a bad taste in your mouth, and, and for good reason. And I, I I think that companies finally recognize that after a while, and that's why there's no more World War Two World War Two shooters. Like as often or none at all because well, the, also, the game. Company... I also very strongly feel like Anthony that in, in in that regard, we've hit an apex in our culture, and you might agree with this. Where we're not having originality thrown down our throats anymore. We're having yeah, yeah. remakes and sequels and rehashes and adaptations thrown down our throats mm-hmm. stronger than ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's rare. It's very rare that we get original content. Um. Like, yes, Mass Effect Andromeda is original content in story and, and characters and things like that, but it's Mass Effect. It's a, it's a, well, like a well-known franchise. And... Uh, no, keep going. I, 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 I want to say something. I'm trying to think, like, I was trying to think, of, I was trying to think of like where to go with that further, because I can't really think of where to go with that further. Like, this past three months of 2017 I've really only like paid attention to to, to uh, things that are already part of franchises like Overwatch say. Overwatch is still the only original thing that I've put any time into mm. and when I like a fully original thing you know mm. but I would argue to, to counterpoint there are original ideas but they're coming from the indie scene like that have a lot of ideas that are that's and that's my that's my point like like people always go like why are like why aren't why why isn't hollywood taking any chances and i was like well they're not throwing the money at the things that they don't think can possibly make money so indie developers are making this original content Mm -hmm. so yeah there's one thing i want to point out from the chat that i think butters put a good point um, he said, if you have to take into account, it has been a long enough stretch of time that there is a whole new generation of gamers that were not playing games from that big cluster F of World War II games. Uh, to you and me, yes, it's overdone. To others, it's new. We are not the primary de- demographic anymore. And I'm not, and, and you are a hundred percent right, Butters. Like, and I've, I've pointed that out in numerous conversations Anthony and I have had in the past as well, that my nephews have never played a World War II game. Mm-hmm. Never. And they they'll get to with this because they their dad plays Call of Duty and they love Call of Duty so they'll definitely play World War Two. Mm-hmm. But here's my question: Now having played games that have that take place in the future, that have like futuristic cool weapons, that have drone strikes and and remote control vehicles and just rad stuff like that and running on walls, will my nephews be able to downgrade? And go back to 1942? Will well, the generation that this demographic is for want to do that? I mean, depending on how it's used. I mean, like, we're in the age where VR is much more of a thing and could be used for educational purposes, but I get your point. I don't think that kids today want to be educated when they want to be entertained by a video game, because let's be honest, did we? Uh, I mean, I played some some educational games on a computer. I forgot what it was called. Number munchers, I think it was called. <laughs> where, it was a, it was, where it was a game when you how I learned math. Same thing for. But if I handed you if I handed you number munchers or Pokemon, what would you play? Uh, right now. You play Pokemon. You know, when you were a kid. Oh, when I was a kid. Oh. Pokemon. Po- yeah, yeah Pokemon. It's, it's Pokemon. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, Shut look, up, look. I I it's love Pokemon. number munchers, man. When I was a kid, I loved that game. <laughs> I don't care what he says. It was that in Oregon Trail. Um. <laughs> But um, I get your point, though, for sure. Um, and, and I'm not talking about individuals as much, Butters, and you're right about that. It depends on the person. Yeah. But I truly feel that as a generation, as as a whole group of, of, like, of, of consumers, I just don't think 
I don't think World War II will be as popular as it was when we were playing on the PS1 and PS2. Now, well, technically just PS2. I don't think there was a World War II game on the PS1. <laughs> right, right. But I will say, just before we close it out, um, the one idea or the one kind of, uh, I won't say counter-argument or just kind of like as far as like how an idea is overused but people still love it is Mario. Mario has been a game. Uh, Mario's been a seri- uh, has been a franchise. Has been around for a very long time. We have a new Mario every other year, and not even every other year. Uh, the last the last primary Mario game was Mario World, and that came out in that came out three years ago. Yeah, Super and, Mario World. Let me look that up real quick. Okay, but yeah, like that that's a franchise, and that is a game where it has literally been around since the nineteen eighties, and people still love to play Mario, and that game has. Made, it, I mean, it literally is the same story for the most part. There's definitely some Mario games that uh, they take the story in different routes or they have a different setting for Mario, but the the constant is always there. You're Mario. You're there to solve a problem or to save somebody. Sure, but let me let me let me kind of tell explain to you why Mario has stayed relevant and not oversaturated over the course of years. All right. The first Mario game, it was a side-scrolling platform. And the second one was a side-scrolling platform. Mm -hmm. The third game, a 3D platformer. Adding the 3D element changed it entirely. Brought a whole new birth, like, uh, uh, just just wealth to the fucking franchise. Mm -hmm. The fourth game, they gave him a goddamn jetpack and water. Mm -hmm. That was drastically different from anything we'd played. Granted, it's still a platformer, but it wasn't a traditional platformer. Mm -hmm. It was a new element. Um, and then the fifth and sixth games were Sun- or, uh, uh, Galaxy 1 and 2. But if you notice, the next game was not that. The next game was New Super Mario Brothers. And New Super Mario Brothers was lampooned for being too much like the original. Trying to really nail in that nostalgia market. And the kids that had played Galaxy, the kids who that had already like kind of got used to 3D Mario... Or the new Mario didn't care as much for New Super Mario World or New Super Mario Brothers. Uh, the the market share totally explains that, like just in general. Um, and then they were like, okay, let's let's take the idea we did on the DS with Super Mario Land, Super Mario 3D Land, and do that in a full fledged form with Super Mario 3D World. And that sold like goddamn hotcakes. Like that sold really really well because that. It kind of hit the nostalgia mark, but still had that 3D aspect, and that's and people really enjoy that. I gotta get my hands off this damn table and stop shaking my camera. Uh, uh, and and to keep that in mind, each of those games came out so far apart from one another that it didn't stagnate the market. It didn't it didn't become like if you have pizza every day for a month, you're gonna get tired of pizza. Oh yeah, yeah. If you have like pizza every day for a month, you are gonna get tired of pizza. Like if you have chocolate every day for a month. You're gonna, you're gonna hate chocolate. Like it's the reason why I don't eat at my job because I know that I would get bored of it pretty quickly. When I was when I was uh, when I was around 10, 10 to eleven years old, uh, my uh, my mom was disabled and my because she had carpal tunnel. My dad was living uh, three hours away. We didn't have a whole lot of food. There was just not enough money coming to the house, so we had to go to a food closet. The food closet had a lot of hot dogs and top ramen. Guess what I'm not interested in at all as an adult. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Too much, too much of a good thing can definitely uh, wear on you, um, especially if it's especially if it's a game or a certain. And, that, and just to add on, just to before we close it out, uh, as I said before, um, you can only go so much off of what history has has for you. At, at some point, you may have to make some original ideas in that time era if you want to dive into I think me. I think Anthony the Vietnam War, the Korean War, the Cold War are definitely wars that you could take from that would be fun and different enough to go back to the past. Got to get back Samurai Jack. <laughs> uh, I I think that's I think that's a proper way to end it actually. <laughs> I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything else. That was too good. That was too good. Um, thank you for watching, guys. Uh, this has been Mission Star Podcast. Uh, we are live every Sunday night at 8 p.m. Pacific time on this Twitch channel. Where we talk about games of all sorts and new topics of the game industry that we get into. 
Um, before we go, uh, Greg, where can they find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at ChubRockEek, and you can tell me how wrong I am on my opinion. <laughs> um, feel free to. We can have a discussion via Twitter. Uh, you can follow me on Snapchat at ChubRockSnap. Uh, you can follow me streaming every Saturday on twitch.tv slash half empty e tank, which I think they're currently still live. They were playing um, Tabletop Simulator. Oh, okay. So the minute this ends, uh, the auto host is going to go to them then, probably. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, I stream every Saturday on that channel. Um, and, uh,. You know, I thought about doing this, and I, I guess I'll just—I guess I'll just say it out loud. If you have an Xbox One and uh, you want to follow me on Xbox One at Chubrucky, just search for Chubrucky. Um, I do take like uh, screenshots—not screenshots, but uh, uh, clips of my gameplay things that I'm doing. If there's something funny or kind of outstanding that I think I want to share, I do that that way. Um, I wish there was a way that that could just go straight to my Twitter. That'd be awesome, but I don't think that's a possibility yet. So yeah, um, if you want to follow me on Xbox and you have that, go right ahead. Uh, um, I think that's about it. I'm working on a uh, working on a review for um, uh, Master Blaster Zero. Still, I've been lazy because of Mass Effect. Oh well, uh, yeah, that's obvious. <laughs> um, I mean that's but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Defect of Naruto. You can follow the work that we do at MissionStartPodcast.com. Let me second here as I bring up the end slide, uh, which I need to update actually, honestly. Um, so if you enjoyed this podcast, if you enjoy watching tonight's uh, uh, shenanigans on this Twitch channel, uh, we upload this on our website on Tuesdays and on our podcast feeds. Just look up Mission Start Podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. Goes live usually around noon or afternoonish. Um, and uh, you definitely get the audio version of this podcast. Uh, we're also on YouTube. Uh, the link's below. Want to check it out? Um, but yeah, also we host a uh, podcast. We talk about conventions of all kind, anime, video game, comic books, whatever. We give our thoughts. We give our opinions. We also give advice for people who are going to conventions uh, that may be new to said convention. Uh, check out the Conover, which is on iTunes and Stitcher as well as also on our website at in the podcast section of our website and last but not least check out the rolling 20s and they are a comic book they are a entertainment movies video games kind of everything in one podcast hosted by Jeremy Wilson uh, on the site and it's also on iTunes Stitcher and in our website in the podcast section uh, of our website uh, usually up every Friday usually up on Fridays um, but uh, I digress uh, one other note, um, we are hosting uh, a, uh, another podcast, uh, movie podcast on Tuesday this week, which will be me, uh, Greg, and Derek. We're talking about Power Rangers, because uh, we all seen it, and we're yep. going to talk about it um, on Tuesday at 8 p.m. on our Facebook channel, uh, Facebook, uh, I want to say channel, Facebook page, sorry. You got that there, Porky? <laughs> And uh, you can, uh, if you want to check it out, the Facebook link is below uh, this video stream as you're watching. Also, one other note before we end the show. Um, we have our own Twitch server. Uh, we, I set one up uh, when it launched the desktop app. And uh, click on the link below. If you click on it, join on it, you get to be able to um, uh, watch this and also chat at the same time uh, with other people and other stuff that we kind of we can do in that, Twitch, uh, in that Twitch new app that they are launching. So, yeah. Anyways, that's it. That's gonna do it for for uh, for us. Uh, I need to go eat. Um, so, with that being said, thank you for watching, and we will see you guys all next time.